Tim, Professor Perrin, thank you very much for giving me a couple of minutes. You're very busy. You're presenting the ICON data tomorrow. And uh, we've been discussing a lot about that at this conference because the, the, the flag was waved at ASCO earlier in, in the year. And uh, people are really quite excited now that we might, after 14, 15 years of not very much happening in uh, advanced ovarian cancer, we might be getting to see a, a little crack happening. Could you uh, enlighten us? Yeah, I think, that, I think that's right. I think it's a really exciting time. As you say, this is the first the first new drug that we've looked at in ovarian cancer for since the middle of the 1990s that's that has shown any effect. Yeah. And the drug concerned is bevacizumab or Avastin. Mm -hmm. So the ICON-7 trial was a, a randomised trial. Um, the control arm of the trial was standard chemotherapy with carboplatin and paclitaxel given mm -hmm. in the usual way for six cycles, one cycle of treatment every three weeks, and then no further treatment. Yeah. And the research arm of the trial Patients were treated with, chem with chemotherapy and bevacizumab for six cycles yeah. and then received bevacizumab for a further 12 cycles of treatment, which made 18 cycles or 12 months of treatment in total. The primary endpoint for our trial was progression-free survival. Um, and the study showed that progression was, progression was delayed and occurred mm -hmm. less frequently in patients treated with bevacizumab than, than in the control arm. Now, these are patients with advanced uh, ovarian cancer. Have they had debulking? They, they, what, what sort of so these were patients who had got ovarian cancer, primary peritoneal cancer, or fallopian tube mm -hmm. cancer. So, so the population of, of patients that would be treated as ovarian cancer in any cancer centre around the world. And they, the patient population that we included in ICON-7 was designed to be as representative as possible mm -hmm. of, the, of the population of women with ovarian cancer who would receive chemotherapy as part of their standard treatment. Mm -hmm. So our study included quite a, included a proportion of patients who got early stage disease, so stage 1 or stage 2A disease with high risk factors, so clear cell cancers and grade 3 cancers, as well as the patients who had got optimally debulked and suboptimally debulked more advanced ovarian cancer, stage 3 and 4 disease. The vast majority of the patients had had surgery. About 2% of the patients didn't have surgery. And that was because surgery just was not indicated because of the nature and extent of their disease. It was never going to help those particular patients. Did it matter? Which it didn't appear to matter really? at all. Really? Yeah. The effect that we saw for bevacizumab seemed to be replicated across all of the subgroups that we that we looked at. So volume of disease didn't seem to be So the amount major. of residual disease didn't appear to affect to affect what we call the hazard ratio, mm -hmm. so, the, so the, statistically, the statistical effect of reducing the risk appeared to be constant, whether the patients had got early stage disease or more advanced disease. But that's quite new. I mean, most um, of the studies I've seen of, uh, of new agents in, in ovarian cancer have been better in the less disease there was, mineral disease or... Well, this is... This is interesting, of course, mm. because as, as ever, if you've got a, a statistical effect that's constant across the groups, you see apparently less benefit in numerical terms sure. for, for the low-risk patients sure. and a bigger benefit in numerical terms for the high-risk patients mm. because if you reduce the events by 20%, 20% of a lot is a lot and 20% of a little is a little. So it appears as though the effect is bigger, although statistically the effect size is much the same. Uh, side effects of bevacizumab? Side effects of, uh, of bevacizumab are really very manageable. Mm -hmm. Things we know about bevacizumab is that it causes hypertension, mm -hmm. raised blood pressure, it can cause proteinuria, and we saw some of that in patients, and about 18% of patients who were treated with bevacizumab needed to be treated with additional antihypertensive drugs, as opposed to about 3 or 4% of patients in the control arm. But that was very easily done, usually with one, sometimes with two antihypertensive drugs. And usually the effect on blood pressure was reversed when the bevacizumab was stopped and the patients were able to come off the, the antihypertensive drugs later on. So there had been concern from some of the earlier studies uh, with bevacizumab that, uh, that fistulae would develop, so abnormal connections between internal uh, organs or abscesses or, or, or perforations yeah. of the bowel. Also seen in the GI studies. Of Those were seen in, in, in the GI studies, seen in the advanced ovarian cancer studies, and seen to some extent in the lung cancer mm -hmm. studies as, as well. Um, and indeed, we did see those, but they occurred at a very low level. Um, 
at most five, six, seven percent of patients developed those sorts of complications. Um, the effect, the complication rate was about twice as high in the patients that received bevacizumab. But it was not confined to the group of patients that received bevacizumab, and it occurred in the, in the control group as well. So if you had, say, a 6% chance of developing a, a fistula in the bevacizumab arm, about 3% of patients in the control arm developed uh, such complications. Now, of course, bevacizumab is given IV. And what's the, the, the patient tolerance like over a, you know, a whole year of, uh, of, of therapy? It doesn't seem to add substantially to the burden um, for patients uh, receiving treatment. And when we looked at, at, at quality of life, quality of life was seen to improve as patients went through both chemotherapy alone and chemotherapy plus bevacizumab. So the addition of bevacizumab didn't seem to adversely affect the patients. That improvement as the chemotherapy started to work was seen in, was seen in both groups. So it did seem to be reasonably well tolerated. It's a monoclonal antibody as opposed to one of these small molecule targeted drugs. And in general, the monoclonal antibodies seem to be uh, tolerated much, uh, much better. And when you get on to the maintenance phase, of course, the chemotherapy is not being given with it. You're just receiving the bevacizumab infusions. And patients seem to tolerate that part of the treatment really quite well. Not, not dissimilar to the patient experience when they're receiving a drug like Herceptin, of course, which is also a monoclonal yeah. antibody. Do you think you stopped too soon? That's, that is one of the questions that we will have to answer in future research. Yeah. I don't know the answer, and clearly we can only comment on, on the research that we've, that we've done. Yeah, sure. I guess what we know from GOG is that continuing bevacizumab beyond the end of chemotherapy was important. Because one of, in one of the arms of that study, the bevacizumab was given with the chemotherapy, but not continued beyond yeah. the end of chemotherapy yeah. as maintenance. And although they saw an effect of bevacizumab, it was a very, very much smaller effect yeah. than they saw in the maintenance group. The GOG study carried on with their bevacizumab for about three or four more cycles than we did in our study. They also used twice the dose, yeah. but they treated a much higher risk population of patients. So they had no early stage patients and they had no optimally debulked patients in their, in their study. So whilst, we, whilst about 50% of our patients had, had had a progression event, about three quarters of their patients had had a progression event. Yeah. So it may be that the bigger the apparently bigger effect that we see in the GOG study is a reflection of the patient population that was treated and the much higher event rate that follows from that. So the maintenance question seems to me to be pretty well wrapped up and it's really very, very encouraging and this is you know, a, a, a big step forward. I mean, it may just seem to be a few months at the moment and it's, but it's only pro progression-free survival. We're looking at it, we're not looking at all the curves and we've got to wait another few years, maybe a couple of years for our survival. Overall survival, which of course is absolutely the key end point. Absolutely, sure. Um, will be ready in 2012. Right. And the minute we've been asked to do an analysis of, of the overall survival for what's potentially a regulatory submission mm -hmm. by Roche and Genentech, to the European Medicines Agency and, and, and the FDA. Um, and as part of that, we, were, we had to do an overall survival analysis. They don't accept the data unless that's been done. So we have seen a non-significant trend okay. in favour of improved overall survival, but it's, no more than it's, that. It's just really too early, Tim, and you and I both early. know that. Tell me about the, the other question, which is uh, chemotherapy up front, plus or minus bevacizumab. It's not the question you asked, I know, but what's your gut feeling about that? You're talking about primary chemotherapy? Yes, primary chemotherapy of plus bevacizumab. Yeah, I mean... The, Is the case made now, or what do you think? Well, we haven't tested bevacizumab in, in that group, Abs and that's, that's the, the key thing. But the, the thing that's changed in ovarian cancer management in the last five years or so is that we are now using much more chemotherapy as the very first treatment yeah. of patients with ovarian cancer. We're not operating on those patients who've got advanced disease, who've got ascites, who've got poor performance status, who've got low albumin, who've got edema. Those patients do really very badly indeed with surgery, so they're receiving chemotherapy as the primary upfront. treatment. Up front. Now, can you add bevacizumab in, into that treatment safely? At the moment, we don't know. There's concerns about bevacizumab and its influence on wound healing. Mm. We've got the concerns about bevacizumab from the advanced recurrent ovarian cancer patients with the fistulae and perforations and what have you. It's an area that we're going to have to look at, I'm sure. But the, 
one of the questions that will arise is what do we do with the bevacizumab at the time that the patients are operated on? Because our standard practice in that group at the moment is to give three cycles of chemotherapy, improve the patient, operate. get the disease to respond, then operate, mm. and then finish the chemotherapy. And that's, what, that's where those studies have taken us at the moment. So we've got studies looking at, at that. The EORTC did, EORTC did a very important study. The MRC um, study uh, will be ready in the next year or 18 mm. months. That's finished recruiting now, looking at the same question. But neither of those studies have looked at a chemotherapy alone yeah. versus, mm. versus um, surgery followed by chemotherapy. So I think that's the unanswered question. If you are going to use it, what's the optimal time to do yeah. the surgery? Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, doing the surgery at the end of chemotherapy has ne never been shown to be useful in any of the studies that we've done so far. Well, it's very unpopular with the patient, as I recall very well. I used to do a lot of intrapartial yes. studies, as you know, and uh, was not, it was not easy to, uh, to, to sell. Tim, thank you very, very much indeed. I really appreciate uh, you uh, giving us a little bit of a glimmer here. Very optimistic uh, data, and I think uh, we, we might be looking at what they call a paradigm shift, are we? Well, it has to hope so, but I think the, the paradigm will shift in a little while. It's not Good. quite shifted Not quite yet. there yet, but on no, the way. More, but more data. Clearly, anti-angiogenesis uh, treatment, and there are lots of them around, lots of possibilities, does seem to have some sort of impact on ovarian no, cancer. My, I think that's absolutely right. And my, my final conclusion to, in, in, in the presentation mm. that, that I will give tomorrow will be that this treatment will influence the discussions that doctors have with their patients. Mm. But I think more importantly than that, it's going to influence the design of the next generation of trials. Sure, sure. Tim, thank you very much. I did appreciate it. Good okay. stuff. Thank you. Thank you.